Good morning and welcome to Altitude Church. We are a community of believers that gather in person and online to experience the power of Jesus in our lives and in our community. As we prepare for worship together today, let me throw it over to my staff to tell you more about what we have going on this month. Do you know that every building needs a strong and solid foundation or it will not stand? You know, life groups are the foundation for our church. You know, some time ago, my wife, Renee, almost died due to complications from surgery on her back. And it was our life group that came to the hospital to be with us and pray for Renee. You know, our, our life group, our, our people, right, um, sometimes we call them our peeps, were there for us. They were our support and our foundation during a difficult time in our lives. And they were the hands and the feet of Jesus. Life groups are about doing life together with Jesus as the center. You know, we come together for prayer and fellowship. We grow and learn how to become more like Jesus. So I want to invite you to be a part of a life group, a place where you can do life together. Or perhaps you want to start or even lead a group. You know, for more information about joining a life group, go to altitude.church groups. Every first Sunday, we host Growth Trek right after service here in our Long's Peak room. We'll take you through our four main values, knowing God, finding freedom, discovering purpose, and making a difference. If it's not something you've been a part of yet, whether this is your first week or you've been around a while, it's a great next step to take in your journey with God. You'll learn a lot about us as a church and you might even learn something new about yourself. So if you haven't been a part of it yet, we'll see you next month. We may be young as a church, but we are definitely growing, and we're really feeling these growing pains in our This Generation Ministries. If you were to peek back at our kids' ministry space, you would see our rooms full of kids, actually so full that it's time to open additional rooms. And between high school hamburgers and our April Youth Night, we've had an amazing start to our student ministries. Growth like this is exciting. But if we're going to take care of all these kids and youth, we need more grown-ups. And that's where you come in. If you are at all curious about what it will look like for you to take an active role with our kids and youth, come talk to me. Also, if you are a middle school or high school age student and you would like to help in kids ministry, I'd love to talk to you about that as well. I can't wait to help you get involved. And I promise that once you meet these kids, you will be as bought in as we are. I was baptized back in junior high. And when I was in the water, my youth pastor dunked my head, but he didn't quite dunk me all the way under. And so afterwards I went to him and was like, dude, we've got to redo this. You did it wrong. And he explained to me in that moment that baptism is just an outward expression of what's going on inside of our heart as we give our lives over to Jesus. Over the past few weeks, we have had the honor to baptize over six different people who have taken that incredible step in their faith journey. If you would like to be one who gets baptized and makes a public declaration of the life that Jesus is pouring into you, then I would encourage you to fill out one of the Connect cards, either online through the QR code or with one of those cards that's in the seat in front of you, and we will start a conversation about getting you into our next baptism experience. Hi Altitude Church, uh, I'm Luke, I'm one of the youth leaders here. Um, I've been helping out with High School Hamburgers for the last couple months. Uh, within the last week we nearly served 70 students who also graciously accepted our prayers over them. Uh, this church has given them a space to come in to be a part of the community to give them something more. Um, the students are very gracious for that. Uh, I'd also like to say that the principal has sent a uh, the staff and faculty here at Altitude Church a thank you letter that our generosity has done a lot for this community and it is making this community a better place. Thank, thank you. you guys for everything. Thank you. 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 And Altitude Church, never forget that your generosity is making a difference in this community. As always, you can find out more information on anything you've just heard about and more on our events page at altitude.church slash events. We're so excited that you've chosen to worship with us this morning, whether online or in person. Now let's prepare together to engage with God in worship. Our service will begin shortly.
Well, good morning, Altitude Church. It's good to be with you today. Why don't you stand as we give our offering of praise to the Lord.
nothing like the children of God coming into the house of God to lift up the praises of God. Amen? It's so good to be here with all you today. In case you haven't met me yet, my name is Gage. I'm the worship arts pastor here. And I just want to be the first, if no one's done it yet, to say welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for, with all the churches in the area, I think we uh, actually, as a staff, figured out there are seven within a two-mile radius. Uh, thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. And, you know, speaking of that, how great, what a testament that God is moving in our, in our town, right? Amen? When you need more churches, that means God is doing something. And that is just the best. That excites me. I hope that excites you as well. If you are new with us, or if you just haven't done it yet, be sure to fill out a Connect card uh, before you go today. If nothing else, then just the mere fact of doing that, uh, we will donate $5 to the local fight against sex trafficking in the Denver Metro, which again, very big deal, very exciting, very important. But you know, if nothing else, uh, that, is a, that is the first step in us getting to know you. And, you know, because that's the thing. We want, we want to know you, and we want you to know people. And Connect Card is the first step in that. So if you haven't yet, please do that, even if it's just to say hi or even if it's just to, you know, get that uh, for, so for us to throw another $5 at, at human trafficking in, in Denver. Um, other than that, uh, we just want to say thank you for your generosity. Uh, beyond just keeping the lights on here, your giving above and beyond allows us to do things like, I don't know how many of you guys saw uh, during the announcement reel, pre-service, uh, high school hamburgers, entirely funded by your giving. And we had, on average, 60 to 70 kids a week, over 100 served in that window. All from across the street. And like, like Luke said on the video, you know, the administration at the school reached out and just said, thank you, this is making a huge deal. A hamburger, a hamburger wrapped in foil is making a huge deal. Isn't that amazing? And then on a global scale, like Al shared last week, uh, as, a, as a state, the Church of God of Colorado has donated over $200,000 to the relief effort for the church in Ukraine, the church in Germany that is taking a lot of those refugees in. And all because of your giving. All because you are willing to be generous with what the Lord has given you. We are able to make an impact, first in our city, but then also in our world. So thank you. Again, we're so glad that you're here. If you would now, just turn your attention toward the screen as we continue with our service, and Lee will be up in just a moment. Well, welcome family. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Some of us are awake. That's okay. That's a good start. We'll, we'll get there. So uh, my name is Lee Brown. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, we are in the midst of a series called Deconstruct, Reconstruct where we're talking about some of the, you know, simple things in life. Like today we're going to talk about the issue of why do good things happen to bad people? You probably know that as why do bad things happen to good people, but really, you know, it's two sides of the same coin. And so as we gather today, we're living into something that I always say at the start of my messages, that we're not here to hide from the problems of the world, but we are here to be transformed by Jesus. Amen. And we believe that Jesus is wanting to transform our city and transform your life. The reality is, we come into this space with baggage. And, and I don't want you to hide from the baggage that you have because one of the things we often say is that you know, most of us are like the rest of us. We, we come in with, with these hurts and these habits and these hang-ups, the things that, that make us lose sleep at night. But each of us comes into this space with that. 
But what we want to know is that we're not just living into our problems, but that God truly does transform our lives so that we can know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. So as I get into this, I want you to know that I'm not just saying that most of us are like the rest of us. Like, I am coming into this space with baggage. So about a month ago, I started feeling really compelled to pray a prayer that sounded something like this, real simple, just, God, restore all that the enemy has stolen in this season. That's what I felt like I needed to pray, right? Because you see, starting in March of 2019, my wife and I began facing trials and traumas that include anything from, you know, having to fire staff to the untimely death of my father, my grandfather, car issues, house issues, uh, the old church building flooding from one of the two merger churches that helped to launch Altitude. And by the time we started averaging it out, we realized that over the course of from 2019 to 2021, we faced one life-changing big issue about every three weeks. And so as we're getting through this, like these traumas starting in March of 2019, so March of 2020, my wife and I looked at each other and we said, all right, that was our year. We're done, right? Everything gets better from this point. March of 2020. So by 2021, March rolls around, we kind of hoped out loud, right? We hoped out loud that this would finally be the time things get better, but we also recognize that we're still in the midst of multiple cascading global pandemics and the world is still on fire, so we kind of recognize that situation. So by March of 2022, after three years of facing these trials and traumas back to back to back, we just kind of looked at each other and said, don't say it out loud. <laughs> just... <laughs> Just, just keep our mouths shut, right? And so about six weeks ago, uh, we started having some more issues. We, you know, my, my wife's car had some issues, and thankfully someone here took care of that. It was so awesome. Uh, and then, you remember that windstorm that happened, like the big windstorm about a month ago? Yeah, that, that knocked over our fence. Uh, it took our shed from the backyard, flipped it alongside the front of my house, and positioned it on top of like the shared fence that my neighbor and I have, so that it also uh, was scratching up the siding and alongside there. So we call insurance, and we find out, well, we have a $2,500 deductible, but they'll take care of it after that. You know, we follow Dave Ramsey. We have a little bit of an emergency fund, but 2500 wasn't exactly in the picture. And so Pastor Ron and Stan came over, helped us put the fence back up, the shed. We just threw away. It's gone. Um, but thank you guys for that. Really was life-changing. Things are getting better. And then Pastor Ron and I have to go down into my crawl space. And while I'm down there that weekend, I happen to look across and I see water. I'm like, uh-oh, that's not good. So I'm calling insurance while I'm vacuuming out like 20-ish gallons of water. And eventually, really eventually, uh, insurance finally sent someone out to investigate why this problem was going on. And you'll never guess what it was. Really, you're, you're not going to guess. It was my dryer. My dryer was flooding my house. Just the crawl space, the subfloor, you know, there's like water and stuff getting down into there. Uh, you know, it's got this uh, steam function on it. And apparently at some point, somehow, some thing inside the dryer kind of went kaflooey. And there was water just kind of dripping down into the casing. And then that kind of went down behind along the wall and ran across the subfloor and then down into the crawl space. And so I'm like, awesome. So, you know, call insurance. That's another $1,000 deductible. So, hey, we're, we're moving forward. Things are going. And uh, they kind of took their time, but we're getting there. Uh, and so then that's all like this Friday, Saturday, right? So Monday of that week, I am driving to the Colorado pastor's prayer lunch. Pastors from across the state are gathering together to meet with the governor, to meet with the mayor, to pray over our city. Because if there's nothing else that we're doing in our world, 
When we pray for our city, it makes a difference. And so I'm driving downtown, and a semi comes into my lane up there. And wouldn't you know it, at some point, because I have to exit off, the semi throws a rock, and it hits the windshield on our one decently respectable vehicle. And so I call insurance. I'm like, hi, do you recognize the sound of my voice just yet? They're like, is this Lee Brown? I'm like, it is Lee Brown. How did you know? And they're like, hi, what's going on? <laughs> like, well, the rock hit my windshield. And they go, okay, well, here's the good news. You only have a $1,000 deductible. I'm like, awesome. Here we go again. Here's the bad news, if you want to call it bad news. Um, the windshield is only going to cost $900 to fix because apparently, you know, there's cameras that impact the self, you know, like parking things. I don't, I don't know. I might, my car doesn't even do that. But whatever it is, there's cameras. And so you got to fix the window and recalibrate the camera. So $900. So we live with a crack in our windshield now. That's it's the way that's going to be. Like, it just doesn't get any better. And so all of that's happening. I wish it was the end of the story, but legitimately, as we're dealing with mold issues in our basement, where, yes, they put up the bag, but then they just kind of sat there for a few weeks. And what we kind of figured is insurance really isn't taking care of us, care of us, care of us. If that wasn't subtle enough, you know, they've spent a lot of money on their awesome commercials, right? So they're also paying a bit of attention to their bottom lines. And so all of that's going on. And then my daughter and I both start having breathing issues. I haven't carried one of these around since I was a teenager. And now I also have a nebulizer. And so I go into the doctor with my nebulizer stuff to see what's going on because I sound like, you know, like there's Swiss cheese coming out of my lungs. And, and they go, when was the last time you had this issue? I said, I have no idea. Let me look on the nebulizer fluid and see if there's an expiration date. It expired in 2015. So I'm like, okay, so that tells you this is about how long ago it's been. So we're dealing with all of that. And then insurance finally moves us into an extended stay. So now we're displaced as of this weekend. And then I start feeling this strange sensation kind of right here in my body. And over the course of the last two days, start asking around. My mom's a nurse. I'm like, what's going on here? And guess what we figured out? I'm experiencing, for the very first time in my life, kidney stones. Yes, so if you see me playing with this little thing right here, it's, it's not because I just like to fidget while I'm preaching. Like, I'm just channeling some of the things so that I don't, like, mean mug you. Like, what is wrong with this guy? Why is he looking at me so angry and stuff? So I can take away some of the facial expressions that my wife distinctly warned me I cannot have while I'm on stage, right? And so we're dealing with all of these things, which, by the way, my wife had kidney stones back about two years after she had had our son. And she told me this. She said, I would rather give birth three times in a row than ever go through kidney stones. Well, I'm having contractions, so it's awesome right there, right? And so we're still dealing with all of these things. So that's been my May and June. How are you guys doing, right? Yeah, so we are going to explore this question, why do bad things happen to people? That's what we're going to talk about today is we deconstruct this and then reconstruct where God wants us to be. And so we are going to dig into a text in Scripture known as Job. Now, it's spelled the same as Job if you're looking for it in your Bible, but it's Job. And so I would encourage you to turn there. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to give you a little bit of setup here as to what's going on. And I, and I want to tell you, you know, last week I read through the entirety of the text we were in. I'm not going to do that this week. I'm going to summarize because Job is 42 chapters. And some of you can already smell the food from the event that's going to happen after this. And so if you have your Bible, turn to Job chapter 1. And if you don't have a Bible, you can download one or on that resource wall that's right out those doors. We have some Bibles we would be glad to give to you for free. So Job chapter 1 starts out like this. There was a man named Job in the country of Uz. 
He feared God. He was of complete integrity. He turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep and goats, 3,000 camels, 500 yokes of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man in all of the East. So here's the setup. We meet this man named Job. He's rich. He's probably very good looking, right? He has plenty of kids, which in this system of this ancient world would have been a symbol of power, a symbol of authority. And the text goes on to tell us that Job loves God and serves him like no one else. So let's pause there for a second. Because as we're going to discover, Job is about questions. And one of the first questions you might have is, did Job really happen? As in, did this person exist? And did these stories that we're hearing, uh, were they actually historical events? And the answer, which you're not going to like, is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, remember last week, we looked at a parable of Jesus, and Jesus told this parable about two sons and a father, but what did we learn about parables? They're not historical events. They're stories that have a purpose. And Job is not written in the same literary style that you would have seen at the time for recording historical events. It was prose poetry. Now, I do happen to believe that Job actually existed and that this probably happened. But if that is not the case, it should not break our faith. Because it, at at worst, is a parable to understand what happens in all of our lives. And so what happens to Job? Skip down to verse 6. It says, one day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, walking around on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him. A man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household and everything he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns. And he will surely curse you to your face. So there's a lot to unpack here. In fact, uh, this might be a good moment to plug The Bible Project, which is on YouTube and and on your podcasts, and they have their own website. They have an amazing 11-minute video summary that digs into the major themes of Job. And so if you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to check it out. But essentially, there's this being that's known as the Satan. It's how you would have said it in the original language, which means the accuser. And the accuser comes into a meeting of what some call God's divine counsel. Now, it is important to note that even the way the text is structured, it separates the accuser from the rest of the ones who are talking with God. This accuser then comes before God and does exactly what the name suggests. Accuses Job and even accuses God. Doesn't that sound a little bit like what we talked about last week with the older brother? And so God asked this interesting question. Have you considered Job? Pause here for one more question. Because we have to ask, what's God doing in asking Satan that question? And for most of us, we've heard that God is lifting up Job as an example. But if that's the case. Isn't that sort of putting Job in the crosshairs? And if so, doesn't that mean that God is at least culpable for some, if not all, of what's going to happen to Job next? 
This is an important question. A couple years ago, I was reading the book, Good God by Lucas Miles. And one of the things he suggests in there is that we're misreading the intent. He suggests through reading the style and the prose and the history that God isn't putting Job in Satan's path. The question isn't, have you considered Job? Look at this guy and then painting a big target on Job. But maybe that the way the language is structured, have you considered Job, is more, are you considering Job? Job? Like, have you set your sights on Job? And the answer to which one of those is suggesting who comes first helps us to understand how we paint God or how we see God. And I'm going to circle back to this in just a moment. But regardless of whether it's God or Satan who targets Job, God does give permission for the enemy to unleash on Job. And over the course of the next few chapters, we see Job's life crash in around him. And I mean that quite literally too. Because as you read, you'll see that, that, that all of his kids are in a house and it crashes down on them and they all die. And, and then Job's health is taken away to a point where he's laying in the dust and he's grabbing pot shirt and just scratching at his skin and, and his fortune leaves him to the point where by chapter 2 verse 9 his wife looks at him and says this are you still holding on to your integrity curse God and die I mean I know the woman's hurting but ouch, right? Like goodness here. And so for over 30 plus chapters then, we see Job's friends come and talk with him. And they wrestle with why this is going on. And their answers range anywhere from it's Job's fault to waxing eloquent about deep philosophy while their friend is literally laying in the dirt broken and hurting and they're just talking shop right not really paying attention to him scholars suggest that these four it starts with three ends up being four friends actually represent the best answers and wisdom that the world of that time had to give to answer some of these big questions of life and so this morning what I want to do is sit in a little exercise that fits with the flow of the text to show what four answers we might give in today's world to the question, why do bad things happen? Just to be clear, this is not the four answers that are given in the text. This is a, a parallel to what these friends of Job would have done. And the first response we often see is that everything happens for a reason and so God must have a plan. Sorry, the medicine for my breathing also makes my throat very dry. Oftentimes when you go to someone who has a relationship with God or even a cultural understanding of God and tell them your problems, the response is often, God must have a plan for you. But there's a problem with this. A problem that I'm going to call the evil of problems instead of the problem of evil. And the evil of problems in this is that in that line of thinking, if you follow it to its furthest conclusion, God becomes the author of sin. God becomes the destroyer in our lives. And so another way to see this might be God's will. God's will. Do, do we understand it in such a way that God wills everything to happen and everything that happens is God's will? Well, as we dig into this text, we start to see this very question arise with who put the target on Job? Was it God or was it the Satan? Does God meticulously micromanage everything that happens in the universe? Does God get what God wants? And biblically, the answer is not always. In fact, this text speaks to this by showing us that there are at least three wills in the universe. There is the will of God, which is good and perfect. 
It's for our good and for God's glory. And God, in His omnipotence, His overwhelming power, could meticulously control everything that happens. But God is also a God of love. In fact, Scripture describes Him in the way that all love that's really love actually flows from God. And let me just ask you this. Can you love someone if they control every single action and choice you have? People who have been in destructive relationships. Let me ask you for the rest of us. Can you truly love someone who forces you to love them, who controls every action that you have, who gives you choices maybe, but they're really choices that only they control? That's destructive. It's manipulative. So biblically, God self-limits his power. He could force his will on the world, but instead he chooses to allow us and creation, the, the, the will of the enemy even, to choose against what his good and perfect will is. So in this text, we actually see three wills. There's the will of God, there's the will of man, which can thwart the will of God. We can choose to go towards God, or we can choose to make good and evil right in our own eyes. And there's also the will of the enemy, the destroyer, the accuser. And so, one quick example of this, of how it would impact our lives. Famously, uh, actor and, and, and thespian and, and bigger-than-life personality, Stephen Fry was once asked, do you believe in God? And if not, why? His response was, cancer in babies? Really? In other words, if there is a good God, how could this being that is still in the process of entering into our world have something so destructive happen to it. If there is a good God, how could there be such things as cancer? In other words, can we believe in God at all? But here again, we come to the question of the text, who, who put the bullseye on Job's back? Because if God controls the universe, then yes, cancer in babies might be his responsibility. But is there a possibility that our will gets in the way. Or even the will of large corporations who, for sake of profit, try to make food cheaper and cheaper. and they, So they try to put things into our food and things into what we drink and things into the air. And I know if you get too far with that, it can start to sound really conspiracy theorist. But even if you just go back to a documentary from a little over 10 years ago, Food, Inc., you see one of the scientists in that documentary saying, we no longer eat food. We now eat food like product. Think about it. Google pictures of watermelons from the 1600s. They look nothing like what we've engineered to today. And then there's the smoking gun, right? A bag of potato chips from your local grocery store, which has this warning label on it. Consuming this product, a bag of chips, mind you, consuming this product can expose you to chemicals which are known to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. The good news is they're on sale. And they're really inexpensive this week, right? So I've spent a little too long here, but I hope you can begin to see that not everything that happens is necessarily God's will. And so the second response we have then is kind of the opposite of that. Nothing happens for a reason. It's all just random chance. So we move from saying that God micromanages everything to assuming that God really doesn't care to get involved in anything. This is kind of the watchmaker argument that God is a disconnected, distant creator who maybe created the world but then sat back and said, okay, kids, have fun. I'll see you later, right? Yet the witness of Scripture and history 
is a God who is involved in his creation, who, who loves his children, who, who really gets into our stories. So rather than me sharing an illustration here, I'd rather just ask you, how has God changed your story? What are some things that have happened? Maybe if you're online, you can drop it in the comments section. Or if you're here in this space, you can talk with someone afterwards and just share the story. How has God shown up in ways that you can't explain otherwise? I promise you hear story after story after story. It gets really hard to believe in a God who's disinterested. The third response is often that God is punishing you. This is kind of the the Greco-Roman view of the gods, right? Zeus sits on Mount Olympus and is just waiting to throw the lightning bolt at whoever goes out of line. And when bad things happen to us, many of us do assume that God is punishing us for our sins. In fact, some relish the idea that God would punish at least some people, right? This group over here that we have a problem with, and, and we... Or we wrestle with this idea that how could, how could a God of love have any wrath at all? So we've got to move quickly, but let me just say biblically, yes, God does have wrath. God is just. And when things happen that are unjust, it breaks God's heart and causes righteous anger. In her book, Another Gospel, singer and author Elisa Childers was quoting a Croatian theologian known uh, known as Miroslav Volf. And Miroslav Volf said this, I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love, and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is love wrathful, or maybe I'd say God has wrath. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed, and over 3 million people were displaced. My villages and my cities were destroyed. My people were shelled day in, day out. Some brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Though I used to complain about the indecency of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God's, God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. And then Childers herself adds, simply put, without the wrath of God towards sin, Heaven would be full of hell. Look at what happened just two weeks ago in Texas. A good and loving God cannot stomach his children massacring little ones without becoming angry. But here's why our good God is so good. God doesn't even have to punish sinners. Hear me on this. Sin has its own built-in punishment system. God allows the consequences of our choices to cause damage because if he didn't, we would be nothing more than a world full of robots. But here's where it gets even better. God doesn't just allow evil to happen He sits with us in our pain. And so the evil of problems here is that if God has no wrath, if he's aloof, if he's distant, then God becomes vindictive but not just. When we choose sin, we reap death. That's what the Bible says. It's an agrarian language, like imagine planting a seed and then seeing a crop produce later. When when we pour into death, When we plant seeds of death, we reap death. When we cheat on our spouse, we reap the effects of a broken marriage. When we lie and cover our tails, we reap the effects of it getting easier to lie next time and then easier to lie next time 
and then easier to lie next time. When we choose sin, we walk away from the goodness of God and our hearts darken. Sin chosen freely punishes freely. But God offers forgiveness and grace. God offers a way back towards his heart. He tells us that no matter how far we've walked away, his grace is unreasonable. We just have to repent. Not just say, oh, I'm sorry, God. Just turn your head, though, because I'm about to do it again. But truly have that change of heart. And for that God to be good, he not only must hate sin, he also must unreasonably be willing to forgive sinners. And that is the testament of Scripture over and over again. And so the last one, real quick, the fourth response is this. You haven't been good enough. You haven't been good enough. The extreme other side of blaming God for everything is blaming ourselves for everything. Now remember, there are three wills in the universe. God's will is one, there's ours, and there's the will of the accuser. And so one of the tactics the accuser uses is that if it can't get you to curse God and die, maybe you can curse yourself. Maybe you can live in this doubt and shame spiral that causes you to walk away from God, not because you're choosing disobedience, but because you don't want God's holy eyes to look at you. But here's the evil of problems. We can't earn our way to God. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. It is an unreasonable gift from a God who is filled with love and mercy. So unlike shows like what maybe The Good Place would have you believe, Heaven isn't this scale system of points for the good and points for the bad so that everything in your eternity and probably really your life too boils down to mathematical equations. God is so much greater than that. Yes, the law of reaping and sowing says that when we do plant seeds for sin and death and destruction, that's what grows. But God in his mercy intervenes to where we truly can find freedom. And there's a difference between us receiving bad consequences and God looking at us as bad people. Because the witness of scripture is that God created you in his image. He sees you as his child. And as his child, even in our brokenness, he hopes the best for you. He tries to lead you on right paths, and he offers forgiveness. God says, you are his. If you need a reminder of this, just pop back to the Mother's Day message that Chandra gave, or the Easter message I gave before that, as we talk about that. Because God is painted as a very different God in Scripture. In fact, as we get towards the end of Job, we start to see God finally show up in the narrative. After his friends have blamed him and blamed the world and blamed everything, we see Job face to face with God. And do you know what God's response to the problem of evil is in Job? Are you ready for the answer that he gives? He doesn't. <laughs> like, that's what scholars have wrestled with in Job for years. There's, there's no resolution to it. God simply shows up and he starts asking Job these questions that upend his answers. But in this, we start to even see the character of God more. Because as Jesus says in his last words through earthly human lips, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, I will be with you even to the end of the age. And through a modern lens, as we look at these responses that God gives to Job, like, have you seen the horse? Do you know where the boundaries of the waters are? You're like, what kind of questions are these, God? But in what I understand about the ancient way of understanding this text in the day, 
Job was honored that God even showed up, that he got to spend time in God's presence. And so whenever I close out my message, I oftentimes try to give us some way to respond back to God. But today, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to tell you God's response to the problem of pain, the problem of suffering in our lives. God's response to the problem of suffering is to provide his presence. And let me just ask, the last time you were in deep pain, what more did you want? You didn't want someone who had all the answers in that moment. Sure, it would have been great to have at some point. But in the depth of your sorrow and in the depth of your pain, the thing that you most want is someone to be there for you. And I can tell you today that in my pain, which, yeah, I may have made light of some of my situations, but I know people in this room right now who are dealing with far worse. In the midst of our pain, God promises his presence. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trials. You will have struggles. You will have tribulations. There will be pain. That's a part of the human existence after the fall. But the promise consistently throughout Scripture is Emmanuel. God is with us. And maybe... If you're not one who's currently experiencing trauma and pain, maybe you can be God to someone else around you and be with them. But if you're in this space right now, and, and this describes you, this, this question of why do bad things happen resonates through your heart because you can feel the pain of it. I just want you to take a moment and hear this. God is with you. He has not abandoned you. He will not forsake you. And in his love, he is here. We're going to do baptism here in a few minutes. And we're going to celebrate. But for a moment, I want us to sit in this chasm between the way things are and the way things should be. Most of us are right here in this in-between. And if that's you, I want to invite you to respond, not because it's up to you to do something for God to break through, but because when you respond, you recognize God's presence more and more. In fact, of the response stations we have in the room, the communion that you can uh, receive, the, the cross that you can go back to, right back there you'll see there's some candles and those candles aren't there to, to light a candle for someone who has passed. Those candles are there as a reminder for us. Because in Scripture, whenever you see God's presence, it's denoted by light and fire. And so right where you are, if you want to take some time during this next song and just cry out to God, if you want to come to an altar, that's, you're more than welcome to. We'll be here with you. Or if you want to go back there and just light a candle, recognizing that God's presence is here and that you want more of God's presence in your life, I can promise you, He shows up. He shows up. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, five or six weeks ago, I started asking this question that became a prayer. Jesus, would you restore in this season everything that the enemy has stolen? And for some in this room, the things that the accuser of our souls has stolen look like hope, look like peace of mind, look like physical things like houses and cars, look like lost jobs, broken friendships, broken relationships. Jesus, in the midst of all of those things, help us to remember first and foremost who you are, that you are our Father. You are a good God who isn't sitting on Mount Olympus waiting to throw lightning bolts or when we do good like Willy Wonka, give us a chocolate factory. You are a God who loves us, who walks with us in the brokenness of our own choices, 
or even when someone else's choices spill onto our canvas. You are God who sits with us when the enemy tries to attack us. And you are a God who loves us. So with all of that in mind, Jesus, right now, we pray together, would you restore all that the enemy has stolen in this season of life? And would you help us to recognize your presence in this moment? Jesus, it's in your holy, your powerful, your loving, your gracious, your tender, your caring name that we pray. Amen. Would you respond to God as he is leading you?
baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, the Bible says that when just one person comes to faith, there is great rejoicing in heaven. So let's take a page from the good book. Let's stand and let's contend with the celebration in heaven in this room today. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness saw through the shadows of my soul your work is
God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. God, for, for our time in worship, we pray that our offering was pleasing to you. For the word that Lee shared, I pray that just as the Bible says that your word will not return void, God, that, that people's hearts were encouraged by it, that seeds were planted, Jesus, all in the name of making us look more and more like you. And most of all today, we thank you for Sky. We thank you that we got to share and witness the celebration of her baptism today, God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. It's in your name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us today. What a day it has been. And it's not over yet. Uh, two quick things to run by you guys just to let you know of. First one, slightly less important because it's seven days away, Growth Trek is next Sunday. Typically it is the first Sunday, but since it's summertime, things are getting a little fun and funky. We're doing it next Sunday. So if you have not done Growth Trek yet, if you've been waiting for that, Sunday the 12th, right after service, over here in, oh my goodness, I cannot keep the name of these, these rooms straight. That one. That one. That one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know there's Pike Peaks Mount, Pikes Peak, Mount Evans, and the other one. Longs Peak, Longs Peak. I did it. I did it. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you haven't been through Growth Trek yet, that's where we, you know, dig into our fundamentals, what makes us the community that we are, you know, and hopefully in that journey, if you want to join us on it, you can go a little bit deeper in finding God, finding freedom, discovering your purpose, making a difference. It's where you get to know a little bit more about us and we get to know a little bit more about you. So again, next Sunday, right after service. But today, the important thing, I hope you don't have lunch pans because we are doing our first ever family table today, which if it's a funny name, it's because it's new. And basically all what family table is, it's a potluck style lunch gathering. And you know, like we have tons of food, like what better thing after worship than just to break bread together so if this is news to you and you're like oh i can't come i didn't bring anything no 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 no. please come we have so much please help us get rid of all this food and you know let's like let's join as a community this is the next part right we want to know you we want you to know us we want you to know other people this is where we get to know each other this is where we get to share a meal we get to kind of share our hearts a little bit with each other and uh, i mean free food what's better than that right so Yes, if you don't have lunch plans, we'll see you out there. If you do change them, we'll see you out there. It's been a wonderful morning worshiping with you all. Have a great day.